I am free. Praise the Lord, I'm free. No longer bound. No more chains holding me. My soul is resting. It's such a blessing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, I'm free. Greetings. My name is Kima Lassiter, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Arts and Outreach Coordinator for the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission. Today, we're visiting historic Stagville, which is a state historic site located in Durham, North Carolina, on a portion of one of the largest plantations in the state. Shortly, you'll hear from Historic Stagville's Assistant Site Manager, Khadijah McNair, and United States Colored Troop reenactor, Bernard George, as they discuss the history and legacy of Juneteenth and its importance of celebrating the liberation and freedom of enslaved people in North Carolina and across the country on June 19th. We hope that you enjoy this message. I'm Khadijah McNair, the Assistant Site Manager at Historic Stagville. Um, Stagville preserves a portion of one of the largest plantations in North Carolina. At this plantation's height, it was over 30,000 acres large, and there were over 1,000 people who were enslaved throughout this property. Today, we are sitting in one of the four preserved enslaved dwellings on the site. In this building, we know at least 10 people were forced to live in a room this size. I am sitting with Mr. George here. So, Mr. George, would you mind introducing yourself? Yes, I'm Bernard George. I'm from New Bern, North Carolina. Uh, I come from about seven generations of New Bernians and Eastern North Carolinians. Can you tell me a little bit about what you do? Some call me a local historian I, by profession. I'm a city planner, but I've been involved with uh, history and studying history since my days at North Carolina Central University and even before then. But I'm a reenactor. I'm a Civil War reenactor, and the person I portray, the uniform I portray today, is that of Dr. John Van Suri de Grasse who was the first uh, African-American doctor to be admitted to a state medical society in uh, 1851. And he was also the second African-American to receive a medical degree in this country. Can you tell me some about Juneteenth? Uh, what is it? Yes, Juneteenth is the official date in which um, Major General Gordon Granger gave his standing order, order number three, to the citizens of Texas, stating that they were forever free and that the bonds that tied master to slave were broken and they were to be, uh, their relationships were to be equal, on equal footing. So uh, Juneteenth from that point was uh, celebrated uh, in Texas by those new, newly freed enslaved people. And that was June 19, 1865. And this was, uh, these were the last people, the last enslaved people to be freed in this country. So it, it is definitely worth celebrating. And they celebrated Juneteenth, that first Juneteenth uh, in 1865. They celebrated it vigorously, even though some of them were still enslaved and kept enslaved by their masters or their former masters for several years, in fact. But those who were, they celebrated that freedom, and that freedom continues to be celebrated today. Why is it important that we recognize Juneteenth today? Well, Juneteenth is the most celebrated uh, event in African-American history today. You know, we celebrate a lot of dates uh, that celebrate our, our freedom from slavery, just like the 
ancient Israelites when they crossed the Jordan into the promised land, God told Joshua to uh, pick up 12 stones from the middle of the uh, Jordan where God had parted the waters for the people and the ark to cross over into the promised land. And he said, take those and, and, and build a memorial to what God has done for you. And that's what Joan Tinth does. That and other events that celebrate the freedom of African people here in America celebrates just that idea that we are taking these events, we are memorializing these events, and we're thanking God for bringing us through such a difficult time. Can you tell me more about the USCT's role in the Juneteenth story? Yes, let me back up a little. Here in North Carolina, there were about 6,000 black troops raised uh, for the US colored troops. New Bern, my hometown, was the center of African-American recruitment during that time. And the first North Carolina colored troops, which later became the 35th USCT, the second North Carolina Colored Volunteers became the 36th, of course, and the third became the 37th United States Colored Troops. Eventually, when they were changed over, in fact, um, when the Bureau of Colored Troops was created on uh, May 22nd, 1863, and eventually all the state's uh, colored troops, as with the white units, were designated based on the states. But the Massachusetts unit, the uh, 54th and 55th, and the first Rhode Island retained their state recognition. All the other uh, colored troop units, the regiments, which were 175 units, composed of about 180,000 soldiers, were given federal designations after uh, May 22nd, 1863. But my story continues as the units, as the Civil War wound down. We know that um, Richmond fell in uh, April 3rd, on April 3rd, 1865. And uh, it was led by black troops who were the first to march into that city. Some of those black troops were part of the 37th United States Colored Troops, the 3rd North Carolina Colored Volunteers. The other colored troops that were engaged, in fact, the 37th had uh, two of its members to receive the, uh, the, the, the Medal of Honor in that Battle of Chaffin's uh, Farm during that time, the fall of Richmond and Petersburg. But anyway, going back to my story, when the war ended, the South, basically, and especially here in North Carolina, wanted those black troops out of the areas in which they occupied. They were one of the first to march into the city of Wilmington, the last port in the Confederacy to fall. They also marched into Charleston, the first state, as we know, to succeed from the Union. And they also marched into Columbia, South Carolina, and there was uh, uh, General Sherman, he uh, focused on uh, Columbia, South Carolina, because it was the capital of South Carolina. And so these troops were eventually forced out of these urban areas and forced to the outlying areas. At the end of the Civil War, the white troops would get, were the first to be furloughed from duty. Uh, the black troops were kept on as contingency troops. Here in North Carolina, uh, our 35th United States Colored Troops was moved to, to Beaufort and along the coast, uh, away from the urban areas. At the end of the Civil War, there was a um, revolution going on in Mexico, Maximilian. And there was a fear that he may come across the Rio Grande and um, continues some hostilities with the United States. Also, the um, army west of um, the Mississippi had not fully surrendered at that time. They only surrendered on June 2nd. 
the president, along with the Secretary of War, decided to send these troops to Texas. And that's how North Carolina troops, which were the uh, 36 United States colored troops, became involved in Texas. They were stationed along the Rio Grande. They were part of General uh, Granger's army there. They informed the people, as I mentioned earlier, about uh, General Orders Number 3, which freed the people of Texas. So that's how North Carolina's involvement in Juneteenth uh, began, with our own troops also carrying the message of freedom proudly carrying the message of freedom to the last vestiges of slavery in the United States of America. Can you tell me more about what uh, freedom celebrations look like in North Carolina? How did people celebrate here? Freedom uh, celebrations, that's a, good, that's a good question. The freedom celebrations began actually two and a half years, three years before the um, the Juneteenth celebration in Texas. That celebration occurred when General Burnside, some say captured, I say liberated New Bern. New Bern was a target of uh, a federal focus because they had a railroad, it was a seaport, and it supplied, it was a center of supply for much of the foodstuffs and resources to um, Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. So when New Bern was liberated on March 14th, 1862, that liberation occurred and people celebrated in the streets. They welcomed the troops because they felt that this was the first beginnings of freedom for the enslaved in this area. And that continued on. And we continued on uh, with the Emancipation Proclamation, which occurred um, about eight months later, on uh, January the 1st, 1863. We had a Emancipation Celebration in New Bern and in Beaufort. Beaufort was the largest one. And so these activities continued. They picked up momentum. And what they looked like, there were civic speeches, discussions about what the future was going to be for the formerly enslaved, and also express their, their beliefs in God and the providence of the Almighty and protecting them and freeing them like he did for the children of Israel. Should Juneteenth be a national holiday? I believe so. Yes, it should be a national holiday. Now, a national paid holiday, I'm not quite sure, but it definitely should be a national holiday. It's recognized in over 41 states now. You know, uh, some people say, well, we have the 4th of July. Well, I beg the difference. The 4th of July celebrates America's independence from England. But Juneteenth celebrates freedom. It celebrates liberty. It celebrates uh, those final qualities that are expressed in our Declaration of Independence. How do you recommend celebrating Juneteenth? There are a variety of ways in which it's celebrated across the country now. You know, Juneteenth started in, in Texas, but it has spread throughout all the states because of um, the uh, black diaspora, you know, at the migration, the great migration where the Texans have taken this celebration to other states and cities. And it's generally celebrated by wearing our finest, by recognizing our African heritage, our culture, by celebrating our, uh, our love of God, our spirituality, and celebrating family and each other. Thank you so much for speaking with me today, Mr. George. Is there anything else you would like to add or tell me? Well, I'm never at a loss for words, as you can tell. And I, I've enjoyed this conversation with you. I am a reenactor. I'm on my way to um, Charles City, Virginia, 
where we're doing a reenactment of um, the U.S. Colored Troops in the heroic ba battle that they had uh, there at Charles City. My mission is to take some of the whitewash off of history and bring it more realism, more facts. We have a saying in New Bern, we have uh, one history but many stories. And many times we lose those many stories. We, we forget the diversity that America was born of and the diversity that makes us the country that we are. So as we celebrate Juneteenth, we celebrate history. We celebrate freedom. We celebrate justice. We celebrate liberty. In New Bern, uh, I've held uh, several celebrations not I have, but I have been part of an organization that initiated the celebration of the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, which is extremely important. Although it did not free the um, major, vast majority of the slaves, but it was a step in that direction. We also celebrated in New Bern the passage of the 14th and the 15th Amendment, those Civil War amendments that came uh, directly after the Civil War actually moves America closer to the principles of freedom, liberty, and justice that we all uh, cling to, that we all, you know, really cherish in our Declaration of Independence. 13th Amendment abolished slavery. The 14th Amendment gave us due process and equality under the law, and the 15th Amendment gave us the right to vote. And the right to vote is so important in this democracy that we have today and back then too. Those three amendments extended freedom, justice, and liberty to all people in this country at a time when um, Native Americans were not recognized as citizens. At the time when uh, Asian Americans could not, you know, petition for citizenship. When the time, at a time when women, white or black, could not vote. So with those amendments, it opened up, as Abraham Lincoln said, a new birth to freedom as has been said from time to time that the Civil War was America's second revolution. It was a revolution that established us as a country of law, a country of justice, and a country of equality. And unfortunately, with the end of uh, Reconstruction and so, so much the, um, the rise of Jim Crow laws and, and crowned by um, Plessy versus Ferguson, legitimizing separate but equal, and we know that's not the case. All it did was usher in a legal condition for apartheid here in America. And that continued for 60, 70 years from the point that the Supreme Court issued that judicial decision. But uh, we're working today to reverse it. Uh, we're working today to open up the laws of this country to equal justice under the law. And we're working today to make this country more just. And we think that with young people like yourselves, that uh, an old soldier like me, I have carried this banner and now I pass it on to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for this conversation. It's been lovely and extremely informative. Um, thank you for your time. We hope that you gathered and gained some great information about Juneteenth in the conversation between Khadija and Mr. Bernard George. We thank you for joining us. And for more information on Juneteenth, the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission, Historic Stagville, and Tryon Palace, please visit the websites listed in the description of this video. We thank you and we'll see you next time.
My soul is resting It's such a blessing Praise the Lord